Okay, uh, we'll continue our discussion about uh, Lagrangian method for solving constraint optimization problem. And we are going to use Banach contraction mapping theorem to show that the algorithm converges. I hope the lecture on contraction mapping wasn't too much for most of you. Uh, now that you are familiar with mathematical analysis uh, through this course. So today, we are going to study this algorithm, xk, <coughs> lambda k, Okay, this is my T of xk lambda k. Okay, uh, I'm going to define the space y as Rn cross Rm. So n for uh, x and m for lambda. And so t is a function from y to y. What I'm going to show is that under some conditions, uh, let me just write down the conditions. What I'm going to prove is x star regular Uh, the second derivative of Lagrangian is positive definite. Eta is small. Together implies that T eta. Let me let me index T with eta because eta is used as the step size. So T eta is a contraction. in a ball around x star lambda star. Okay, this is what we are going to prove today. Any question so far? So one thing you will notice is that this condition is very strong because we have always assumed that Lagrangian would be positive definite only along the first order feasible directions, but here uh, we require the second derivative of Lagrangian to be positive definite everywhere along all directions, not just along the first order feasible directions. So we'll relax this assumption uh, later in the class today. But to begin with, Let's just assume that this is positive definite. <coughs> okay, so the result is T eta is a contraction not in the entire space, but it's a contraction in a small ball around X star lambda star, which is the optimal solution Lagrange multiplier pair for this problem. Uh, T eta, okay. Uh, so what does the fixed point of T look like? So T eta of x star lambda star will be equal to x star lambda star. This would imply that my gradient of x L at x star lambda star, actually this is the fixed point. So this would be equal to zero and h of x star <coughs> will be equal to zero. So the fixed point of T eta would be uh, the point that satisfies the first order necessary condition for optimality. <coughs> okay, uh, 
you know I'm I'm uh, I'm probably confusing you so this x star lambda star is not the same as this x star lambda star which is the solution to the optimization problem so let me just change the star to bar which denotes that this is a fixed point of t and what I want to show is that any fixed point of t eta would satisfy the first order necessary condition for optimality. Okay. So if we show that t eta is a contraction in a ball around x star lambda star and you pick a point that is close to x star lambda star and you run this iteration, you're guaranteed to converge to the unique fixed point which is x star lambda star and that would satisfy the first order necessary condition for optimality. Okay. Is the argument clear? So now all we need to show is that this is a contraction under this assumption. So let's do that. So let me assume that I'm picking two points, y1 and y2, close to x star lambda star. Then this is, and then I want to find t of y1 minus t of y2. This is equal to gradient of t of y y1 minus y2, where y is uh, some psi y1 plus 1 minus psi y2 by mean value theorem. Okay, so I apply, so I have x star lambda star, I draw a ball around it, so I'm picking y1 and y2 in the neighborhood of x star lambda star. Uh, and by mean value theorem, I know that there exists a y on this line joining y1 and y2, such that t of y1 minus t of y2 is given by this expression. Uh, now what I'm going to show is, Row of gradient of t at x star lambda star is strictly less than one. Or oh, I'm I have to carry eta everywhere, so please remind me if I'm removing eta. So I need to show that this is strictly less than one. <coughs> the spectral radius of the matrix is strictly less than one. <clears throat> what would happen if this is true? So if the spectral radius at this point of the derivative of t eta is small or, or is less than one, then it means that the spectral radius everywhere in this ball, or rather you can pick a ball such that the spectral radius within that ball is always less than one. So this would imply that 
spectral radius of derivative of t eta at of y is less than 1 for all y in the ball B. Oh, uh, B, I want to give it some name, this ball, not B. What should I give it? Okay, C. Have we used C anywhere? No, we have not. So let me give this set a name C. And this would be true for all y and c. Okay, so this is a uh, this is a slightly complex uh, sequence of steps that we are going to do. Um, so please uh, pay attention. Uh, maybe you can write a little bit later, but pay attention. So. I want to prove that a map is contraction in this ball C. Um, how, do I, how do I prove that? So I can pick this ball. This ball is not something that's given to me. I can pick this ball and I can figure out what the radius of this ball should be, uh, depending upon the parameters of the problem. So I need to show that T eta is a contraction. In order to show that, I need to figure out what the difference between T eta at two points is. So I, I have this mean value, from mean value theorem, I have this expression. Uh, we know that y is always going to lie in this particular ball, no matter which two y1 and y2 I pick, because it's a convex set, it's a ball. Uh, this y is always going to be within the set, because it lies on the line joining, line segment joining y1 and y2. So in order to show that this map is a contraction, I need to make sure that the spectral radius of this is strictly less than 1. How would the spectral radius of this be strictly less than 1? Well, if I prove that the spectral radius of the, uh, of the center of the sphere is less than 1, then by continuity of spectral radius, we will have that the spectral radius of the derivative of t eta would be less than 1 for all y and c, where I can pick the c such that this condition holds, okay? So I can shrink the C, I can shrink this ball uh, until this condition is met for all Y and C. Okay. Let's try and prove this statement. Okay. Oh, um, before we prove this statement, what would this imply? This imply that there exists a norm on Rn, Rn cross Rm, such that norm of T y1 minus T y2 is less than equal to rho of gradient of T eta y plus or T eta x star comma y star plus epsilon no. Rho of the gradient plus epsilon norm of y1 minus y2. And this epsilon can be picked arbitrarily small. So for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a norm on Rn cross Rm such that this condition holds. Okay, any question? So this is something we did at the, uh, we did this at the very beginning uh, of the lecture. So I think in lecture one or two, uh, I had uh, mentioned this result and we are going to be using it now. So what was the result? If A, the result that I had mentioned, I think in lecture two perhaps, so a spectral radius of a matrix A is less than one implies there exists 
for every epsilon greater than 0, there exists a norm such that a x norm is less than or equal to rho a plus epsilon norm of x. This was the result that I had mentioned in lecture 2. And it's there in appendix. The result is there in appendix, but the proof is not. I don't know where you can find the proof of this statement. I myself haven't uh, done the proof of this statement, but I believe Bertseka, so I assume that this is correct. <laughs> okay. Uh, I haven't found the proof yet. That's just because I've never searched for one. Uh, okay. So this is exactly what I'm using here. Uh, for uh, I'm using mean value theorem. I'm from this particular uh, statement, which I can prove, I'm concluding this. And from this, I'm able to show that t eta, t eta would be a contraction around x star comma y star. Okay? These epsilons and deltas and the radius of the ball, all of that has to be picked appropriately, so all of this argument would work. Okay? But, uh, but this will work. Okay? All this argument will work by picking an appropriate choice of epsilon, deltas, and the radius r for this particular ball. Okay, so now the fact that T eta is a contraction just hinges upon the fact that I need to prove this spectral radius of gradient of T eta is less than 1. Yes? So how do you define this at C? Sorry, I didn't understand. The set C uh, in which uh, Y is Oh, the set C? Yes. Okay, so how will you define this set? Okay, so. Let's say this is true, okay? I can pick an epsilon sufficiently small such that this row will always be strictly less than, uh, okay. Okay, I think, I think let's just do it. Uh, so let me pick epsilon equals to one minus rho gradient of t eta x star y star over 2, uh, okay, then I pick C such that rho of gradient T eta y is less than 1 minus F, uh, let me pick it 3. So I need to pick C such that this is 1 minus 2 epsilon over 3. Uh, so pick okay. So I pick C such that the spectral radius is less than one minus two epsilon over three. So that's how I pick C, and then I pick the norm such that rho of gradient of t eta uh, x star comma y star plus 2 epsilon over 3 such that let me call this alpha. So I'm going to pick the norm such that alpha is equal to rho of gradient t of x star y star plus 2 epsilon over 3. Oh, no, not 2 epsilon over 3, just 2 epsilon. This should be 1 minus 2 epsilon. Now let's see if it is going to work. So this epsilon is strictly positive. Uh, this uh, is fine. So 
So this is strictly less than 1. And in this case, I have rho, rho plus 2 epsilon. So that would be strictly less than 1 as well. So this will also be strictly less than 1. OK, so this is less than 1, and this is also less than 1. OK, so I think all of this will work out. So you can pick an epsilon first, then pick a value of c, such that this equation holds for all y, for all y in c. And then you pick the norm such that this alpha here is strictly less than 1. OK, so hopefully you are convinced that by appropriate choices of epsilon, c, and the norm, you can get this whole sequence of steps to work. Now, I'm not expecting you to concoct these epsilons and c's in this class. But uh, if you're doing research in optimization, you will have to concoct it at some point of time in the future. And the way to learn how to pick these epsilons and norms is to take real analysis 1 and 2 which again, I don't expect any of you to take, or most of you to take, but of course, some of you will take it in the future. Uh, but in that class, you actually learn how to pick uh, these numbers such that everything, the entire argument works. But again, it's a very complicated course to take. I, I encourage everyone to take it, but I don't expect people to take it. So anyways. OK. Uh, we need to prove this. OK, let's get back to work and not uh, diverge from the discussion. OK. <coughs> what is gradient of t eta of y? Uh, this is, or y star, this is i minus eta b, where b is given by L gradient of h minus gradient of h transpose and 0. Yeah. So this is n, this is m. This is n, this is m. So n rows, m rows, m columns, n columns. OK? What do we know about this matrix B? Oh, this is all evaluated at x star, comma, lambda star. So all of these matrices are computed at x star, lambda star. So we know about, so there is a lot we know about this matrix. So x star is regular, which means that this is full rank. This is full rank. And of course, this is negative transpose of this. Uh, and the other thing we know is that second derivative of the Lagrangian is strictly positive definite. So that part also we know. And then eta is sufficiently small. That is by assumption. OK. To show gradient of t eta, the spectral radius is less than 1, we need to show that real part of eigenvalue of b is strictly positive. Okay. 
So this is what we need to show now. Once we show this, I will identify a value of eta such that this is this holds true. Cool. So, so let's get back to this expression. So I want to show that real part of eigenvalues of B is strictly positive. So let beta be the be an eigenvalue. and z w b d eigenvector. So we have b w z equals to beta w z. Okay, any questions so far? Now one thing to note is this B is not a symmetric matrix. That's because this is minus gradient of H transpose. If it was gradient of H transpose, there was no negative sign, then this is a symmetric matrix, but in this case it's not. So since it is not symmetric, my eigenvalue could be a complex number and my eigenvectors could involve complex vectors, okay? So it's not, we cannot assume that beta is a real number or w and z are real numbers. So these could be complex numbers. So the first thing I want to show is that if z is equal to zero, then w will be equal to zero, which implies that z is not equal to zero. Okay. Why? Because if z is equal to zero, then w is equal to zero, and then this is not an eigenvector, right? An eigenvector has to be non-zero. So z must be non-zero. Um, so let's let's prove that. Uh, how about I name this as B11, B12, B21, and this is of course zero. So B22 is equal to zero. So I have B11 W plus, uh, oh, I wrote it the other way. If w equals to zero, then z equals to zero. This implies w not equal to zero, yeah. So b11 w plus b12 z is equal to zero. And minus b12 transpose w is equal to zero. No, 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 no. Wait, uh, this is equal to beta times W, this is equal to beta times Z. Okay. I want to make sure that I've written the correct expressions. Uh, 
Okay. So if W is equal to zero, if W is equal to zero, then the first expression is that B12 Z is equal to zero. Okay. So my hypothesis is if W is equal to zero, then I need to prove that Z is equal to zero. Now can I conclude from here that Z is equal to zero? Yes. Why? Because B12 is full rank. Yeah, so B12 is full rank. It's full rank because I've assumed X star to be a regular point, which means that gradient of H at X star is going to be a full rank matrix. So B12 is full rank would imply that Z is equal to zero, okay? And therefore, W has to be non-zero, which further implies W is non-zero. Okay, yes. Should the second equation be B two one? This one? Yeah. Should that be B two one? Yeah, so B two one is minus B one two transpose. Okay. So that's why I've written minus B one two transpose. We'll need this in a in a couple of steps. Okay, so is this uh, step clear to everyone? Okay. Let's move on to the next step. The second expression is real part of W star transpose. So W star is complex conjugate. Uh, everyone knows what a complex conjugate is? Okay, good. <laughs> uh, then I'm going to multiply it by B11 and then W and that should be strictly positive. Is this obvious? So B11 is a positive definite matrix, okay? Remember, B11 is strictly positive definite matrix by assumption. So is it obvious that a vector transpose B11 and the vector has to be strictly positive? Is that obvious? No? Okay, so let's prove this. So the real part of this uh, value is going to be a strictly positive number. Uh, let me decompose W into A plus IB. Uh, so this is the electrical engineering department. We usually use J for complex numbers, okay? So um, I hope no one will get confused if I use J here, so J is minus one square root, okay? A, A and B are real vectors. A is in Rn and B is in Rn. Okay, so W star A minus JB So I have A minus JB, B11, A plus JB. This is A transpose B11A minus J B transpose B11A plus A transpose B11JB plus B transpose B11B.
what is this equal to? Zero, right? Because B11 is a positive definite matrix, so it's symmetric. And this is B transpose B11A, this is A transpose B11 transpose B. So these two are the same number, so it's equal to zero. What about this value? A transpose B11A, strictly positive, because B11 is positive definite. B transpose B11B. So this is strictly positive. Okay. Yeah, the, the complex part of this is zero. In this case, because it's a, it's a symmetric matrix. Okay. Any questions so far? So we have proved two results so far. First is that W is non-zero. The second is uh, W is non-zero implies that A and B so at least one of them is non-zero. If at least one of them is non-zero, then this must be strictly positive. So that is the second expression. OK. I'm going to erase most of it now. Now the third part that I want to show is real part of W star transpose B12 Z equals to real part of Z star transpose B12 transpose W. Okay. Uh, let me just uh, make this an exercise. Not a difficult thing to prove, but it can be proved. Okay, so the real part of these two matrices, or not, it's not a matrix, it's actually a, 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 a scalar, so real part of the scalars are going to be the same for these two uh, matrices. <clears throat> Let me leave this as an exercise. OK. Now we can prove this statement. Let's consider Z W star Z star transpose B W star, no, W Z. This is equal to real part of beta norm of w square plus norm of z square and this is also equal to this is also equal to w star transpose B one one W. Oh, I need to put real here. Real. This is, of course, a real number, and this is a real number. Okay. 
let's try to prove this statement, uh, this particular equality first. So B multiplied by WZ, that's beta multiplied by WZ. Uh, so I can take the beta outside or real part of beta outside and then I have uh, the W star Z star transpose WZ which is equal to norm of W square plus norm of Z square. Okay, that's the property of complex number. So A star transpose A equals to norm of A square. Okay, that's the property of, real, uh, of complex vectors. So this comes from the property of complex vector. This one is a combination of three. Well, okay, let's 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 do this particular calculation. So what's where should I do it? Maybe I'll do it now. Everything is filled. Okay, I'm going to do it on this side. So I have W star transpose B11 W plus Z star transpose wait ah minus no not minus but B to one W plus W star transpose B one to Z plus zero. That's this expression. Okay. And I have to take the real part of this whole thing and I recognize that B21 is minus B12 transpose. So this is equal to So this is minus B12 transpose. So I have Z star transpose B12 transpose W with a negative sign and then plus this whole thing, which as we have shown here, they are equal, the real parts are equal. So they'll cancel each other out. So I'm left with only W star transpose B11W, which is what I write here. Okay, I'm going to pause here for questions. Okay, we wanted to prove that this is a contraction, or rather the spectral radius is less than one. Uh, let's assume that we have an eigenvalue and an eigenvector corresponding to that eigenvalue. We want to show that real part of the eigenvalue is strictly positive. So how do we do that? Well, we proved a series of results. So the first part was W is not equal to zero. If W is not equal to zero, then this must be strictly positive. Uh, if this is, uh, and then we have by the uh, properties of complex numbers or complex vectors, we have this uh, easy to prove statement. Uh, once we have these statements, then I multiply to this equation W star Z star transpose on both sides. And once I do the math using this approach, I get real part of W star transpose B11W. Once I do it through this equation, I get real part of beta multiplied by the norm of W comma Z. This is positive. This is positive by second equation. So therefore, real, time, real part of beta must be positive. Okay? This implies 
real part of beta must be greater than zero because there is equality in these expressions. <coughs> so somehow we needed to have this uh, eigenvector in all the equations in order to prove that real part of beta is strictly positive. Yes? Uh, no, B is a real matrix. So, if you're thinking of a complex contour, I think someone said, why, why do we need to take the real part of this one that we were done with? This one? Yeah. This one is automatically real, but we are just taking real part. Um, I mean, this matrix is real, so we don't need to take the real. I mean, the real part is equal to the matrix itself. There's no. Okay. So yeah. why? I mean, why? because we are using real here in this expression, so we want to make sure that real carries over to all the places. So now if we have proved that the real part of the eigenvalue of the matrix is positive, how can we prove that the spectrum Contraction? Is, yeah, not the spectrum yeah so now I'm getting to that, okay? So at this point of time, all of us agree that all the eigenvalues of this matrix B will have strictly positive real part. Now let's pick a value of eta that is sufficiently small. <laughs> Then, let me raise this side. So what is the eigenvalue or one identity minus eta b? This is one minus eta beta one, one minus eta beta n. Uh, or n plus m. I need to show that the spectral radius or magnitude of 1 minus eta b is strictly less than 1 for all i equals 1 to n plus m. Okay, so all of you are familiar with this. If you add an identity, if you scale a matrix and add an identity, then the eigenvalues is scaled eigenvalue plus the ident plus number one. So, uh, so I need to show that if all the eigenvalues or all the real part of betas are strictly positive, then one minus eta beta i is strictly less than one for all i. For sufficiently small eta. So let's look at the absolute value of 1 minus eta bi. So it's 1 minus, I need to split beta into real and imaginary. So let me consider beta, what should I use? C plus id, no, I, have I used c? Yes, I've used c for the set. Let me just use c plus i, c plus j. D. So 1 minus c, eta c plus j, no, minus j eta d, absolute value. This is equal to 1 minus eta c square plus eta square d square which is equal to 1 minus 2 eta c plus okay if I pick eta sufficiently small this term with a negative sign will dominate the second order term of eta. And therefore, by picking eta sufficiently small, I can make sure that all these inequalities are satisfied. Okay? So I can pick eta very, very small so that all these inequalities are satisfied. And that's because this term is going to dominate this term for values of eta small. <clears throat> so
So that's the, that's the proof of this statement. So I can pick eta sufficiently small so that the row of this matrix is less than one. And if it is less than one, then it's a contraction in a ball around x star lambda star. If it is a contraction, you run this iteration, it will converge to x star lambda star. <clears throat> now, of course, at this time, this is the first time when we have been exposed to such a complicated proof. Um, but it tells you the power of contraction mapping theorem, wherein all you need to prove is that the derivative of a function at a specific point has spectral radius less than one. If you can prove that, then immediately you conclude that around that particular point, the map is a contraction map. And so uh, iterative application of that map will converge to that particular point. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions? Yes. Is eta small is bit vague? Uh, you want an exact value of eta? You'll have to look at this expression. So let's uh, <coughs> let me pick eta to be one over. Let's think about it. Let me get a value of eta in the next class. Uh, I'm going to pick a value of eta that looks something like this, square root of c square plus d square, maybe three. Or actually, max over i absolute value of beta i. And multiplied by some factor so that these inequalities would be satisfied for all the for all i's okay so i need to pick eta according to some such number and i'm going to pick this num i'm going to get this number in the next class it's not there in the book that's why i don't have the expression It'll, i'll have to think for some time before i can get an expression like that okay so thank you